Those of you who, uh, I'm going to need a new battery. My little red light's on. Who can get me a new battery? Nine volt, the one you got to lick. Okay? And while he's doing that, uh, Brother Reg sent me a text message just a little while ago, and I appreciate him so much. He loves this church, and um, he is very thankful for us putting on this conference. Uh, I, I really think this year was better than last year. I really do. And um, <clears throat> he, uh, he, when, I, when I was talking to him about it, hang on, uno second. How do you say second? Dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seven, oh, eight, oh, nine, oh, ten, oh. <laughs> That's Spanish. But he had, he had shared with me earlier last week, uh, he was kind of confirming what, what the theme was, and he said God had given him a, a part of a message about God creating us in his image. And the profoundness of that, I, I understood where Reg was coming from in his message. God is life, and God favors life. And God favors those who will protect human life. Even if those people are lost, God gave them the gift of life. And he made that person in his image. Whether they respond to the gospel or not, that's how they were made. And <clears throat> so anyway, uh, he preached that message here. Outstanding message. And then he announced that he was going to preach that same message this Sunday at his church. And um, a couple weeks ago, I'll give you the background, a man in that community had written a letter to Brother Reg's daughter. Reg's daughter is a member of the House of Representatives in Jefferson City, Missouri. She was elected. She didn't think she was going to win. And all of a sudden, this con all this conservative vote came in and put her in the House. And you want to talk about God raising up an Esther in the House of Representatives. She is seeing things that you and I don't see going on behind the scenes. But anyway, a man wrote a letter to her and didn't sign it, didn't put his name on it, but Reg saw the guy do it. And um, I can't remember how he saw it, but he saw the guy put this letter in the mailbox, and when Reg went and opened it up, he saw it was an unsigned letter to his daughter, and it was just calling her out as a hypocrite for believing in the Second Amendment, but for, for being against abortion, but believing in the Second Amendment. And so this morning, that man showed up for church at their church. And 15 minutes into the sermon, this guy started mouthing Brother Reg while he's preaching about God making us in his image, God being all about life. And the more this guy got mouthy, of course, Brother Reg was telling him, sir, I'm asking you to be quiet. And that man finally stood up and just unloaded his vile evilness upon Reg and upon that church. And, of course, Reg knew who he was. And uh, it finally took the men of that church grabbing this man and forcing him out the door and said, don't you come back. But... Um, Reg just, he sent me a message thanking us for doing what we did here. And um, I'm glad we did what we did. I was glad to be a part of it, just even just by attending. And um, it, it, it was a blessing for me to hear what I heard this week uh, from Chris and from Brother Reg. And um, I'll never forget it. I, I will never forget this year and the conference and the things that God taught us here this year. So I'm very thankful for our church willing to take the stand that we're taking. It bothers me that we did not get an attendance from Jefferson County like I'd hoped for. That bothers me. And we sent out three big advertisements in the paper. 
it wasn't that we didn't try to reach people. But no one came. And that, that's been bothering me. And, um, but God knows how to use what it is that we do here for His purpose, His kingdom, His glory. And who am I to question, you know, how God is going to use this conference? And I just preached this morning about letting God have His way. And uh, I guess I needed a dose of my own medicine. And so I'm, I'm just thankful that God allowed us to do that. And I'm going to, with the messages that we have, we have them recorded. The recordings are, have come out fine and great. We're going to put them together this week and get them out on the internet. We're going to have them available on disk. How God uses that then will be up to Him. and It will be for His glory and His honor and nothing else. And I'm thankful for that. Take your Bible, turn to Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29. We are teaching about hell and hell fire. And is the Bible's version of eternal torment, is it correct? Is the Bible's version correct? And can we believe that if the Bible uses the term fire, can we believe that it really means that? Now, remember something. And you guys don't carry NIVs and New American Standard Bibles and all that junk. I'm telling you that the word hell found 54 times in your King James Bible, 13 times in the NIV. What's 54 minus 13? 31, 54 minus 13, 31, right? 41, okay? 41 times the doctrine of hell has been omitted or changed in the new Bibles, okay? You're not going to learn the truth from these new Bibles concerning hell and hell fire. So Deuteronomy 29, let's, uh, let's, uh, in fact, let's go to the Lord of prayer now and then we'll get into the scripture. Heavenly Father, I thank you Lord for your word and I pray dear God that you would use uh, this church and the word that goes forth out of this church, use it Father for your glory and your kingdom. Father, I can only see in a very limited small way. And so Father, I trust you, I thank you God for even allowing us the privilege to come into this place and to study your word, and to know it. Father, you should have and could have taken us and scattered us out in the wilderness with no salvation and no everlasting life and no Bible. But Father, you brought us to, near to you. You've given us the gift of your word. And Father, you've given us the gift of faith. And Father, we, are, we will always, even though we don't owe you, we will still feel like, Father, we owe you a debt that we'll never be able to pay off. So we'll just praise you for eternity for everything that you've given to us and everything you've done for us. And Father, bless this church, bless the word that goes forth out of this place and use it for your glory and your kingdom only. May your name be praised. May somebody be warned about the fires of hell and ask to be saved from it. That's my heart. That's what I want, God. Not only just teach us the truth, but save somebody from hell's fire. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Deuteronomy 29. God, in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, the chapters sort of go together in that God is reminding Israel of a covenant that he made with them. He said, remember the day that I came down Mount Sinai, and I gave you my law, I gave you my covenant, and you agreed to it. And so in Deuteronomy 28, 29, God is telling Israel, here's what's going to happen. If you keep all my law, and God meant all of it. He said, then I'm going to bless you, I'm going to bless you here, I'm going to bless you there, I'm going to bless you everywhere, and everything's going to be great. If you fail to keep my covenant, which I've made with you and your generations after you, if you fail in that, Here's the things that's going to happen. Deuteronomy 28 lists some things. Deuteronomy 29 carries that idea forward. 
And God says here that the whole land, he's talking about the land of Israel, the land that God's going to give them. The whole land thereof is brimstone and salt and burning. Salt is always related to fire in the Bible. Whenever you see salt, think fire. And it's true. Uh, you rub salt on a wound, that's, boy, that burns. Okay? Anything salt, you get in an ocean, and you've got a sore on you, that salt water gets on there, and it burns. So, and salt itself, and what it does to steel and or iron, is the same process of fire. It's oxidization. It's a slow form. Rust is a slow form of fire. Very slow. But it's the same process. The rust, the iron is being oxidized by the salt, and it's just consuming in a slow way that iron. So anyway, that, just kind of throw that in there. But anyway, he said, It's a brimstone and salt and burning that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein. And he mentions, like the overthrow of how many cities? Count them. Four. Sodom, Gomorrah, Admon, Zeboam. Now that number's there for a reason. Because God offers you a new covenant by way of Jesus Christ represented in the four Gospels. Your alternative is to be cast into hell and to be burned like Sodom, Gomorrah, Admin, Zebulun. So you, you, if you accept Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will escape Sodom, Gomorrah, Admin, Zebulun. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? Which the Lord overthrew in his anger and in his wrath. Even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? Then men shall say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. The same principle applies. If you forsake God's covenant offered to you in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same thing will happen to you for eternity. That's what he's telling you here. So verse 26, For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled. What does that word mean? You kindle, you start a fire. Was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this. Remember the book is important. God's not going to do anything outside of what's written in this book. He is, however, going to do what he wrote in this book if you reject that covenant. So now we get into the warnings against hell. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, Jesus said this, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now I had a lady, Jezebel, who argued with me over this verse. And her point was, there are places in the Bible where God didn't really mean what he said. And I said, oh really? Where? And she said, well, it said, you know, if it hand offends thee, cut it off, cast it from thee. God didn't really say cut your hand off. I said, I beg to differ with you. If you get an infection set up in your hand, and that infection will not go away. Your hand is offensive. It, your hand now becomes contrary to the health of the whole of the body. It is then profitable for you to cut that hand off and cast it from thee so that the infection does, what will they do if they cannot stop an infection that's raging in a member of your body? They will cut it off if they can to save the rest of your body. It is a known surgical technique. It's been done for thousands of years. We're fortunate enough that we get to be knocked out while they do this procedure. My dad, because of diabetes, he lost about four toes, if I remember right. Uh, on one of his feet, he had, he had lost one of his big toes. 
and his little toe or something, I can't remember. I know he lost one of the big toes of his foot. He could never walk right after that. But he lived. The infection that had set up in his toe because of his diabetes would not go. I remember he was in the hospital for a month. And they were not able to stop the infection. So the only option they had then was to cut off his toe to save the rest of his body. This Bible's right. You are better off going through life maimed or halt or without an eye or whatever than for your whole body to be cast into hellfire for eternity. Matthew 10, 28. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember, that destruction lasts how long? Lasts forever. It's an everlasting destruction. In Matthew chapter 11. Look at what Jesus said. Thou Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell... For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Now you ponder that. Jesus is saying, had I gone to Sodom and done the mighty works that I did in Capernaum, Sodom would have believed me. And Sodom would be alive to this day. I would not have destroyed Sodom had I done the mighty works in Sodom like I did in Capernaum. That speaks volumes. Christ went to Capernaum, did his mighty works. They rejected him. And Jesus called them out on it. So in Matthew 18, let's see, is that different? Yeah, it's different. Matthew 18, he's, he's reiterating this issue about part of your body. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee. For it is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet, to be cast into everlasting fire. The fire is everlasting. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes, to be cast into hell fire. The idea is, there is a warning against hell. And the warning is, it is better for you to endure things and hardships against our body. Pam was talking to us guys before church. She'd been going through a tough deal. And it's been with her body, been a lot of pain. But she comes out on the other end of it with a smile on her face, knowing that God's grace is truly sufficient for her. And if you were to ask her right now, Pam, would you rather endure that than go to hell? What would she say? Don't want to go to hell. Don't want to go to hell. Turn to Lamentations, chapter 2. Mm, 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 mm. Lamentations, chapter 2, is a warning to church people about hell. It's a warning to church people. I'm one of these, I do not believe that everybody that goes to church on Sunday is right with God. Churches are full of hypocrites. They're full of people who say one thing on Sunday, do another thing, say another thing the rest of the week. They make a show, an outward show of godliness, but inwardly, they're just ravening wolves. Lamentation chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, He has cut off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel. And he has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. Stop right there. Where is Jesus? What's in God's right hand? When you see churches who refuse to preach and teach the Word of God, 
God has drawn his hand back from them. There's a reason why there's no Bible in there. God won't let them have it. That's his judgment. So he drew back his right hand from before the enemy, and he burned against Jacob like a flaming fire. That exact phrase is found in another place in the Bible. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. Like a flaming fire, which devoureth round about. And he's, he went against Jacob. Jacob is the, the inheritor of the seed of Abraham. Jacob represents all of Israel. And God's anger is pitted against his own people. Judgment really does begin at the house of God first. Boy, I should have preached that this morning. I, that's a first that I left out. Mm. But anyway, verse, <clears throat> verse 4, he hath been as bold like an enemy. This is God. He's been as bold like an enemy. He stood with his right hand as an adversary and slew all that were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. He destroyed the people right out of church. He poured out his fury like fire. The Lord was as an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces. He hath destroyed his strongholds and increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. He hath violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were a garden. Remember what Jesus did in the temple. He was violent. He took and made a scourge and went in violently to the house of God and took away the tabernacle of God from those money changers. And he did it with violence. That Bible's right. So he has destroyed his places of the assembly. The Lord hath caused the solemn feast and Sabbath to be forgotten in Zion, and hath despised in the indignation of his anger the king and the priest. Verse 7. The Lord hath cast off his altar. He hath abhorred his sanctuary. He hath given it up into the hand of the enemy, the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of a solemn feast. The Lord hath purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. Walls are salvation. Walls are a picture of salvation. And God is removing salvation away from these churches. God's taken it away. Um, I got to, let me show you this. I found a church online. It's called the Broadway church and uh where was i going with that i forgot what i was going to say but i've read something on their website that made me think about this now i forgot it so god says move on mike so i'm going to move on where was i deuteronomy or lamentations i might remember it again if i read the scriptures again the lord have cast off his altar and he has abhorred his sanctuary he has given up into the hand of the enemy, the walls of her palaces, they have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of a solemn feast. The Lord hath purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He hath not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore he made the rampart and the wall to lament. And they languish together. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He hath destroyed and broken her bars. That means her protection. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law is no more. And her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. I, I remember early on when God called me into study prophecy, I was hearing from these guys saying they had visions. God was giving them visions about what was going to happen in the end time. And I got jealous of that. And I said, God, I want you to give me visions like you're giving all those people. And I did that three times. Every time I did, God said, Mike, here's your visions right here. All the visions that you need are right in this book. And I'll show you every one of them. I'll show you, I'll show you more than you can handle. And finally, after the third time, I said, God, thank you. I'll take it. I will accept the visions that you have already given to me in the Scripture. I will trust them as your word. And I'll not look for anything else. That was years and years ago. But her prophets also found no vision from the Lord. That means God closed their eyes. And now they're blinded. And they're blinded to the word of God. What did God take away from Saul? God took away his voice. God no longer was going to speak to Saul through visions. 
through Urim and through the prophets. No more. Whenever Solomon, or where Solomon, whenever Saul inquired of the Lord from that point forward, God said nothing. And Saul knew it. Why did God do that to Saul? Because Saul rejected the word of the Lord. And God, what did God do? He took his right hand away. I'm not going to let you read this book. I'm not going to let you know anything in it. And you think about all the preachers out there, all the churches that despise the King James Version Bible. They don't just mix it up with the other translations. They hate it. One man I know, I've told this story, but one man I know, youth pastor of a church, preparing for his Wednesday night message to the teens, and the pastor had got into it with him over the Bible issue, and as this man was preparing his lesson for that night, the pastor came in, looked down, and he said, I thought I told you, never preach out of this Bible again. I thought I told you, I thought I made that clear. You're not going to preach out of this anymore. Specifically told him not to use the King James Version. He left that church. He left that church. So what happens is God's judgment against the people that he has, he has withdrawn his word from them. They're not saved, not going to be saved. He's pulled it and he's done it to the churches. So who goes to hell? Can church people die and go to hell? The answer is yes. 2 Thessalonians 1. Here's that place, flaming fire. 2 Thessalonians 1. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Verse 7. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. I can't wait someday. But you know, we're still here. And if we're still here, the people that need to hear the gospel, who are they going to hear it from? The people that are still here. Because after we're gone, they're not going to hear it. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance. God is describing for you in no uncertain terms, when his wrath comes, it is fire. It is a fiery wrath. He's going to burn it down. He used Sodom and Gomorrah, Admoam and Zeboam. I almost want to say Zebco. He used those four cities as an example to show you hell and his wrath. This is what I do to sinners. So in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Does that answer the question, what if they don't know God? There's your answer right there. Yeah, and God made it very clear. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. You either believe or you don't. And if you don't believe, Christ is coming with flaming fire. And it's going to burn and it's going to hurt. Now, let's talk about the occupants of hell. Who goes to hell? Psalm 917. You can turn to Psalms because we got a couple places there and in Proverbs. So go ahead and head that direction. Psalm 9, Psalm 55. Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Now it is obvious to me, if you look from knowing what the Bible says, that it, we know that in the days of Adam, in the days of Seth, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. But after Seth, through the generations down through Methuselah, Lamech, on down into Noah. What is it we know about Methuselah? Methuselah died the exact same year of the flood. 
Did Methuselah die in the flood? You don't think so? Could be. Because according, to the, according to, the, to the timeline, Methuselah died the same year the flood started. Could Methuselah have been destroyed in the flood? It's possible. Possible. But what we're seeing here is that in, in, uh, from Seth, when men began to call upon the name of the Lord, down to Noah, man had turned into pure wickedness and had forgotten God. Parents did not pass down the knowledge of God to their children. No children then grew up godless, and then they raised godless children who did worse than mom and daddy did. And they raised children who did worse than their mom and daddy did. And it just goes downhill from there. So the wicked, the, the nations forgot God. Then after the flood, we would, we would have to believe that Noah and Noah's sons knew God, knew the wrath of God, and they passed that story down to their children. Daddy, where did we come from? You know, Dad, Daddy, where, what about that boat that you and Grandpa had? Tell me that story again. And those, they would tell the story of how they spent a year on the ark. And for a while, you would say that they knew God. But after a while, they forgot. And that's what we do, isn't it? We forget God. It's easy to do. So this is why Peter, if you read First and Second Peter, Peter's always talking about, I want to stir up your remembrance. It's best, keep yourself in the Bible, keep yourself in prayer, and keep yourself in church, that way you won't forget God. That's my job. My job is to constantly remind you of the goodness of God, the grace of God, but the judgment of God. Okay? So this is why we come together and meet, is because without it, we would forget. And we would forget probably very easily. Okay? That old wicked flesh take over. Psalm 55, 12. For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide, mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together, walked into the house of God in company. Look at that. Do church people go to hell? Let death seize upon them and let them go quick down into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. So, some of the same people that come into the house of the Lord, those same people, wickedness is in their dwelling and among them. On Sunday, they look nice. They look spiritual. They look Christian. They look baptized. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they're living and dwelling with wickedness. So they're, they're playing like they can have two masters. They can serve God on Sunday and then live this vile lifestyle every other day of the week and think that they're going to get by with it. And they're not. Nobody, nobody does. Nobody gets by with it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 5. Let's talk about the woman who's in charge of hell. The woman who's in charge of hell. Do we know her? We know her name. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's her. Proverbs will show you all, well, I won't say all you need to know, but it'll show you a great deal of what you need to know about her. She's the strange woman. She's the harlot. She's the whore. She is the one who slips out on her husband all the time. Okay? She is 
I, and I believe that Babylon is a spirit. Okay? Is a real, live spirit that is in control and has power over the kings of this earth and over principalities and over religious institutions. Okay? Any, any, every other place where there is not Bible Christianity, she's there. She is the other spirit of 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. She is that other spirit, okay? And she, she will, well, she'll do all kinds of things. She'll cause men to be drunk because she's a drunkard. And she hates reading the Bible. She hates the authority of the Bible. She hates the fact that the man in the Bible tells her what to do, and she ain't going to have it. It doesn't take long for you to listen to Joyce Myers to know that she's got an issue with men in authority. Don't take long to listen to her. Figure that out. Okay? Obviously, her husband allows her to get away with what she's getting away with because if he would take his role as a godly husband... He would say to her, honey, sit down and shut up. You're in the house of God. Proverbs 5, verse 3. The lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb. Stop right here. It's my favorite phrase. Stop right here. The Bible tastes like honey. Tastes like honeycomb. And honeycomb's good. Good for you, from what I hear. Amen? Okay? And you chew it for a long time. I guess, you, I guess it's okay to swallow honeycomb. I have. Didn't kill me. Okay? But I want you to notice that phrase. Her lips drop as in honeycomb. She mimics the Bible. Her mouth is a two-edged sword. Okay? The words that she says are as a two-edged sword. She mimics the Bible, pretends to be the Word of God under pretense. The lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But her end is bitter as what? Hold that plate. Look, Deuteronomy 32. I turned right to it. Thank you, God. Deuteronomy 32. Their vine, verse 32. Their vine is the vine of Sodom. The fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Clusters of bit, are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragon. The cruel venom of asps. Because her end is bitter as wormwood, wormwood is bitter like the wine of Sodom. <clears throat> their, grapes, their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Bitterness and gall and wormwood all go together in the Bible. By the way, does anybody know what wormwood is? It's a bitter herb. It, it, it's, a, it's a real thing. And they make a liquor from it called absinthe. You ever he heard of that? You ever drank it? You ever had a little snort of it? I, I have it. But absinthe is a hallucinogenic. You will, and I don't know how it's done, but the testimonies of people that do absinthe do so in order to take a trip. They will hallucinate, and they will see all kinds of nice things. Okay? Hallucinogenics, in my mind, in the way I see it, are open portals to devils. LSD, absinthe, uh, do what? Acid. Okay, mushrooms. Psycho what? Scylla whatever. Psy psycho mushrooms. Psycho mushrooms. They're uh, ayahuasca. You go down to Central and South America. P 
People, I'm not kidding you, people go on tourist trips to South American countries specifically to have a shaman give them ayahuasca, which is an intoxicant and a hallucinogenic, so these people can have their minds opened, and they are, they are seeing all kinds of devil, they're seeing spirits, they're seeing all kinds of stuff. They are opening their minds up to satanic intoxication directly from the devil himself okay and these shamans they charge big money for this huge money they get rich and these people that go on these trips they're told by their guides now when we get there do not try to shake the hand of the shaman do not touch them do not approach them. You can have no contact with them. And if you ask why, they will say, please don't squeeze the shaman. <laughs> I made that part up. <laughs> but anyway, her, her mouth is smoother than oil. Her end is bitter as wormwood. Wormwood is an intoxicant. So anything that causes your mind to not be sober. Now, let me just say this. There's limited uses in the Bible for things that will put your mind to sleep. Okay? When you go have surgery, they use different chemicals to put your mind to bed. Thank God they do. Okay? There's, I do not have an issue with that. There's not a problem with that. Okay? But they are abused, just like everything else is, they're abused, and they're taken advantage of. But anyway, you just get the idea that this strange woman loves to get people high and loves to get people drunk. The spirit that's running the show on this marijuana legalization out in Colorado and out in other places, that's what's behind it. It's her spirit getting everybody high, because that is... If you're high and you're drunk, you'll not be able to know the lion of the tribe of Judah from the other roaring lion who seeks to devour you. You'll not know the difference. Okay? But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. There it is. She mimics the Bible. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. What is the path of life? It's your Bible. Now watch this now. God wants you meditating on the Word of God. And meditating does not mean emptying your mind and reciting passages of Scripture over and over again until you go into a trance. Do not do that. Do not do that. Stay away from it. It's called contemplative prayer, it's called whispering prayer, the Jesus prayer, Ignatian contemplation. They call it after Ignatius de Loyola, the guy who invented it, invented the practice, and he was the founder of the Jesuit order. Chris Pinto was talking about him this week. Okay? But do not let anybody tell you, now clo close your eyes now, now empty your mind, and just contemplate a portion of the Bible, recite it over and over and over to yourself until you enter stillness. Jesus himself told us, don't do what the heathen do. Don't use vain repetition. He told us, don't do that. Because the way she wants to take your mind is not in contemplation of the word of God. She wants you drawn away from the Word of God. She hates it. Okay? Because it makes you free, and she's all about keeping you in bondage and doing what she tells you to do. She's the spirit of communism, as far as I'm concerned, and dictatorships. She's the spirit behind men in government wanting to get away from the Constitution to give them all the power. That's where she is. She hates the Constitution. She is the one stirring up all these students to protest the Second Amendment. She's the one doing that. That's her spirit, okay? Anything that's static 
and unmovable and unchangeable as far as laws are concerned and as far as God's word is concerned, she absolutely despises it. So, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. Now, I'm going to put a picture up on the screen and show you a religious practice that comes from Babylon herself. This is called a prayer labyrinth. Notice that the path is not straight. What is it? What animal is featured in a labyrinth? What animal represents the labyrinth? The serpent, the crooked serpent. And what you have is, you have the, the teaching is, and they set these up in churches. The teaching is, you start at the outside, and you walk the crooked path. And at 11 different stations along the way, 11. What's the number 11 for? Tower of Babel's in chapter 11, Genesis 11. At 11 different stations, you stop, and you recite a prayer, or you recite something, but you, you do, do a vain repetition. Over and over again. But don't think about the meaning of it. Just say the words. Then you go to another station. Do the same thing. The idea is God is waiting for you in the center point. The center point is the middle of that labyrinth. The idea is that God is waiting for you. When you get there, you'll meet God. Now, what you're looking at, the, the labyrinth was not invented by Christians. It was invented by pagans. And the idea was that at the center, that labyrinth was the road to the heart of the earth. Caves meander. The caves are almost never straight. Caves meander. The idea is that you go and when you get to the center, you're in the heart of the earth. There is a God there who is in chains and he's half human half bull and he wants you he needs to be released because he's been in prison there and he wants you to meet him and cut him loose so he can get out of there that's where it came from but the churches will tell you that when you get to the center point that's where you're going to meet and connect with God God's there but you have to walk this crooked path to get there that is not what Jesus said how did Jesus describe the road? Straight. Straight. That's just one aspect of it. Let me go back to that verse. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Take a look off on the screen. On, the, on your left is Novum Testamentum Grace. It is... The Greek New Testament that follows the Westcott and Hort Greek manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. It is called the Nessel Aland text, named after Eberhard Nessel, who initiated this back in the 1800s, and Kurt Aland, who spearheaded the, the movement to formulate the Greek text that underlies every Bible in the world except the King James. See that 28 there? You know what that number is? And it says, now thoroughly revised. You're looking at the 28th time that they have taken the Greek text and altered it and changed it and, re and changed the words that are in it and made it different than the first edition. They've done this now 28 times in 150 years. Meanwhile, your King James has been altered zero times in over 400 years. What does that tell you? Her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. You cannot memorize verses of Scripture out of these Bibles anymore because in five years, they're going to change that verse. The NIV, New American Standard, the Holman Christian Standard, doesn't matter. In five years, because of the changes in the Greek text, they're going to have to change their translation. And they have, and they do. 
always changing what the Bible says. Not static. Not Static does not mean electricity. Static means it's not moving. It's standing still. Amen? So that the verses that you memorized, you can teach them to your children, and they can memorize them, and they can teach their children, and they can memorize them, and a hundred years later, your great-grandchildren are still memorizing the exact same verses that you memorized because they haven't been changed. Her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. That church that I was showing you, that verse, Jesus said, Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And there's a church called the Broad Way Church. And I was looking at their website. Notice their logo, their symbol. The circles... And all those circles there represent the center point. Just like that. Okay? That's their logo. That's their symbolism. And their website says that they are a church that provides safe environments. What does that mean? That if you're queer and you come in, you're a man, come in wearing a dress, we're not going to harm you. We're not going to say anything to you. We're just going to leave you be. You can come here and be... Whatever kind of nasty, filthy thing you want to be, and we're not going to touch. Their website says, we desire to be a non-threatening community. Non-threatening. What that means is, we're not saying a word about hell. Not a word. Okay? That's, that's her. That's her. Proverbs 7, I'm going to be done. Hearken unto me now, you can turn here, Proverbs 7, 24. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. That means read your Bible. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. Young men and old men, watch out for her. She is seductive. She will tease you, taunt you, get you to lust after her. She can be in the form, for us preachers, she can be in the form, or even the church pew people, she can be in the form of a $15 million church building with all the bells and whistles that looks appealing. Looks like it has something great going on for it. Why, that's the church we want to be part of. Lust not after her beauty, the Bible says. Don't do it. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. She hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell. Going down to the chambers of death. Look at that labyrinth. The chambers of death is the center of that labyrinth. That's where she's leading everybody. And I want to... I still pray for the man, a man that I've heard preach over the years, some of the best messages I've ever heard preach in my life, solid King James man, raised his family to love God and honor God and serve God, live right. They caught him at the hotel. He was pastoring a church down in Arkansas. And they caught him at the hotel with his mistress. The men of his church caught him. And they confronted him and they said, Don't bother coming to resign. You're resigned. Your stuff, we'll box it up for you and we'll set it out so you can come and get it. But you are never coming into our church ever again. And I would have thought that this man would have repented, made it right with his wife and his children, grown children, and at least found some way of serving the Lord again. But no. His heart has fallen for his mistress. 
and he followed her to New York, and he's gone. And if you were to, if you were to give me a list of 50 preachers that I thought would do this, he would have ne- his name would have never been on that list. Many strong men have been slain by her. Let's take heed lest we fall. Amen? Amen? Hell is not worth her. It's not. Heavenly Father, scare us. Give us the fear of the Lord. Scare us, Lord, so that we walk the straight and the narrow path that leads to life eternal. God, remind us every day that our enemies out there looking for a way to take advantage of us because her ways are the steps of hell. Father, help us to ponder that and help us to think on these things, meditate on your word, fill our minds with what you're saying and the meaning of it, and teach us, Lord, this Bible so that we learn to walk that straight and narrow path and not get on that other path. Thank you, God, for saving us from that, from yanking us out of the fire itself. Father, we'll follow you the the rest of our life just for doing that one thing. We love you, Father. We thank you for loving us and having such concern for us and how we turn out that you sent your son to die for us so that we can escape hell and her paths. Thank you, Father, for this book, and I know she hates it. It's why, Father, we resubmit ourselves daily to the cause of this book. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen.